Good morning, everybody. We're happy to have you here for our February edition of the Pigment 101 webinar series. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this month, we are taking a deeper dive into azo pigments and uh, the type of uh, applications that these are appropriate for. Um, we will be, this session is being recorded. Um, and all of those in attendance today will receive the link to the recording as well as the PDF of the presentation. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to use the chat box and I'll address them at the end of the presentation. With that, I'll go ahead and get started and uh, take myself off camera. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, we are talking about azo pigments and taking a little bit deeper dive uh, into their chemistry and what they offer to, uh, to us as color formulators. Uh, this is a deeper dive than one that we've done in the past uh, webinar series. So um, I hope you enjoy the, the information. So I, I just wanted to give you a little fun fact about Sudershan. Um, our azo portfolio covers about 45 different color indexes um, of azo chemistry. Um, and with that, uh, we have more than uh, 150 commercial products. Um, these fall into the industrial brands of Sudaperm, the more high performance area, the Sudacolor and Sudafast and Sudajet. Uh, which is our digital, uh, which is our inkjet uh, application brand. Um, and in addition, we have a cosmetic arm um, that these fall into the Sudacos uh, brand um, uh, of products. Our uh, R&D development, um, our R&D uh, uh, team is very active in the, these types of chemistries. Um, it is one of our key uh, baseline uh, type chemistries. Uh, they do follow a very rigid systematic approach uh, using the stage gate process to make sure that essentially all the I's are, are dotted and the T's are crossed along the way. And we are making the, the appropriate decisions um, with our development programs. Um, the team not only considers the coloristic properties that we're trying to achieve, but also making sure that cost and regulatory requirements are, are taken into consideration um, very early on uh, while we're developing the products. Uh, because as we all know, the, the regulatory is constantly changing and we need to make sure that we are matching what's needed on a global, uh, global space as well. Uh, specific applications uh, might require a modification of a, of a current product. Um, so we do work closely with our customers um, and the analytical and application teams to make sure that uh, we can provide products that work for um, our customer specific needs. <clears throat> Um, some applications have uh, more stricter and, and precise requirements, such, such as inkjet and cosmetics. Um, so those types of requirements are always dealt with um, ahead of time as we go into a development program, um, again, to make sure that we can meet the needs of those particular um, application areas. We are always uh, in, uh, in the process of redu reduction of any trace impurities like heavy metals, uh, PAAs, uh, PCBs, and the and and um, areas like that. Um, again, your uh, European re regulations are always changing, as well as other global regulation areas. So we need to make sure that we meet the needs um, everywhere on a global basis. Uh, and then lastly, we are always looking to optimize all of our input components for um, efficiency improvement, as well as uh, keeping a very uh, close eye on our carbon footprint as, as we move forward with new developments. Um, we're happy to share that we have a, um, a silver rating with the Ecovitis uh, organization. So we're really proud of that and working towards our gold rating. <clears throat> so we've seen these slides before. Um, the the azo pigments are part of the are organic in nature. There's two basic types: the mono mono azo and the disazo. 
but they also fall into um, a, another classification um, such as high performance. There are some high performance air, uh, pigments in the azo classification, um, as well as the traditional classical uh, uh, pigments. A little history um, on azo pigments. Uh, the first uh, azo pigment was developed and commercialized in 1885. It's the Para Lake. Um, all the way through to 1911, the, their diarylide yellows and oranges that we all uh, know and love today. Um, up until 1960s, when the uh, beginning of the high performance azo pigments came along with the benzabenazolones. Um, along the way. So these have an old history um, and it's always nice to see some of these old factories um, and the the new factories today um, look very similar, although, uh, although they are certainly more up to date. The first commercial pigment, uh, Pigment Yellow 1, uh, was developed by Herx uh, in 1913 and uh, uh, we were able to find some uh, interesting um, photos of the uh, factory as well as the um, um, chemistry and some laboratory notebooks um, for uh, Dr. Wagner uh, in that in, during the development. <clears throat> And pigment yellow one certainly still exists today um, and is very a very useful pigment. So why use azo pigments? Uh, they are used in all applications um, in solvent water and powder coating systems. Uh, they are uh, very useful for plastics and uh, inks as well as other special application areas that I spoke about in a, a more recent uh, webinar. Uh, primarily, they are the largest in volume, and they are also manufactured in all of the continents of, of the globe. Um, they provide a lot of shades um, for the color formulator uh, uh, in all of us, and they are environmentally stable, um, and, and to a great extent, they are very cost effective as well. So from a shade perspective, there are uh, a lot of different options to choose from uh, in the azo chemistry. And as we take a look at the different uh, color spaces, you can see some of the, uh, <clears throat> the azo products that Shudashan has to offer, uh, which I've highlighted in um, the dotted areas in here. So they range in the yellow space uh, from the very green shade with a pigment yellow three, all the way through to a very uh, red shade with a pigment yellow 83. And then a number of products in between both classical as well as the high performance um, with the um, yellow 151 and the yellow 154. In the orange space, um, a lesser number of azo products in this space uh, with the pigment orange 64 being the more yellow shade and the pigment orange 36 uh, being the more red shade, both of which are in the high performance azo category. Red space, a lot of pigments here as well. Um, on the yellow shade, we have pigment red 2 and pigment red 53-1 are pretty much the, the most yellow um, of, of the options here, while the red 57-1 and red 63-1 um, are in the more blue sp uh, blue shade space. So we've talked about classical and high performance pigments in the past, um, and these both of these uh, classifications do apply to azo pigments. Um, the bulk of the azos fall into the classical um, uh, uh, category uh, with light fastness, weather fastness, and heat resistance on the low to middle end of the ranges, um, which keeps the application areas uh, a, a more limited uh, because of these areas, but they do have their place uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in all of these application areas. The high performance uh, azo pigments that have come along, um, they were certainly developed for that very specific reason um, to improve light fastness, weather fastness, and heat resistance um, in order to, uh, to get them um, more use in those spaces.
So azo pigments. Um, in a previous uh, webinar, we, we we shared some some of this information in the past. Um, they are designated with the azo uh, double uh, nitrogen double bond. Um, uh, that uh, distinguishes all of the uh, azo chemistries, and in some cases, uh, you might see two of those pairs of nitrogen, uh, double bond nitrogens um, with a disazo uh, pigment. So they are uh, structurally based on this general formulation, where the AR is typically some sort of uh, aromatic uh, amine uh, that, that creates the base. Um, then, of course, in the middle, you'll see the nitrogen double bond. And then the R represents the coupling component that comes along um, to create the specific chemistry or color index that you're trying to achieve. It's this coupling agent that allows for the development of a lot of shades and a lot of, of, of property uh, developments uh, for the chemistries. <clears throat> so the uh, azo pigments, um, of course, are, are uh, uh, the electron donors and acceptors that are connected through that uh, nitrogen double bond, which is the uh, chromophore. And as I mentioned, the uh, the synthesis of azo pigments is very uh, economically attractive because it's a very straightforward process. Uh, it's a standard sequence uh, for all azo uh, chemistries. Um, that starts out with uh, the di diazonum salt formation, uh, and then the choice of reaction with the coupling agents allows for that for that wide range of products to be developed. So some of the key properties that have to be considered when uh, when looking at azo pigments and whether you want to choose a more classical version or a high performance one is certainly the chem chemistry of that particular one. With each of these chemistries comes a, a set of, of uh, technical properties that have to be considered for your application. Um, in some cases, there are multiple crystal modifications um, that can be achieved. And uh, again, each one of those will provide different uh, technical properties. In the manufacturing of azo pigments, we can adjust the particle shape, um, the particle size, and the distribution of that particle size uh, as well. And, and each area there will also uh, result in um, things like opacity, uh, dispersibility, um, and, and uh, uh, technical properties like that. Um, surface characteristics uh, are certainly something to consider. Uh, we have the ability to modify the surface with um, with various uh, chemical surface treatments or other additives to be able to um, adjust the uh, the final application um, properties. And of course, heat stability that comes more along with the chemi chemistry of that one. Each chemistry is going to have um, its own set of, of heat stability uh, ratings, and then uh, the finishing steps that are used can modify that heat stability uh, one direction or, or another. So there are many forms of azo pigments, and uh, I'll go through a couple of, uh, a couple of slides to uh, describe each of the categories. The basic classical uh, mono azo yellow and orange pigments um, are probably one of the larger um, choices uh, in terms of azo chemistry. Um, it's here where uh, choosing the, the coupling agent uh, will result in shades from a very green shade yellow um, all the way through to orange. Um, these are, are a bit more limited because they do have um, poor solvent and migration resistance. And the, as I mentioned earlier, are uh, on the low to medium end for heat stability. However, they do have very good light, uh, good light fastness. And for Sudershan, our pigment yellow 1, 3, 62, 65, and 74, and yellow 191 fall into this particular category. Uh, Monoazo orange pigments have fallen um, uh, to the wayside a bit more as the uh, because of, of the, the disazo pigments have come in, uh, taken their place because they do add some additional properties that are uh, very attractive to to the industries that use them. Which leads us to the disazo 
uh, pigment category. Uh, and here, uh, th these are where you start to bring in those two nitrogen double bond uh, on, the, on the crystal structure. Uh, again, depending on the starting materials, you can uh, achieve a wide variety of shades of color. Um, from a technical property perspective, these two have um, a less light fastness and weather fastness than the mono azo uh, uh, counterparts, but they do have better solvent and migration uh, fastness than the mono, mono azo counterpart. Uh, so, you know, in, in some cases, the disazo are, are better than the mono azo, and in other cases, they're not as good. So, depending on your application needs, um, you need to be able to choose uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the subsection that you, that, that's best for you. For Sudarshan, our, our color indexes in this category are the pigment yellow 12, uh, 13, 14, 17, 83, 174, and our pigment orange 34. The B natfall pigments uh, or beta natfall pigments, they uh, range in shade from orange um, to a more medium red uh, area. They have um, um, comparable solvent uh, solvent resistance, migration, and light fastness comparable to the mono azo um, counterparts. And for Sudarshan, this is the orange five, the red three, and the red four. The naphthol AS pigments, or some people just call them the, the, the naphthol reds, um, as the name implies, they uh, tend to be in that yellow shade red area to carmine, and in some cases, um, brown and, and violet. Uh, they do, uh, in some cases, uh, have poorer light and weather fastness than the mono azo uh, area. Um, and the solvent and migration uh, fastness are similar, but still on the marginal end. And for Sudarshan, these uh, our color indexes are the red 2, red 112, red 5, 146, and the red 170s fall into this napthal red category. The azo pigment lakes, um, sometimes they're called the salt type pigments. Uh, historically, these are made from water-soluble dyes um, originally, so once they're precipitated with the salt, they become um, more insoluble um, than the, uh, the, the original dye. Uh, from a shade perspective, these are uh, medium red to a blue, blue shade red, as we saw in the earlier slides. They have limited light fastness, and they, however, and they do tend to uh, migrate some. But they have the purpose, of course. Uh, for Sudarshan, uh, the color indexes are the pigment red 53-1, the red 48 series with 48, 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, pigment red 57-1, and pigment red 63-1 fall into the salt type category. Then we move into the, uh, the uh, high-performance azo pigments with the benzamidazolone. Um, these have shades that range from the green shade yellow um, through orange to carmine to brown. Uh, these, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are designed to improve the uh, light fastness and weatherability. Um, these tend to show up in more high performance applications like automotives and plastics because of those light fastness and weatherability as well as the, the uh, uh, heat stability improvements. Uh, for Sudarshan, uh, we have the pigment yellow 151, the 154, yellow 180, an orange 36, and orange 64. Uh, the other high performance uh, azo category is the disazo condensation pigments. Um, these properties are attained by um, in, in enlarging the the um, I'm sorry, enlarging the, the molecule itself um, over the monoazo uh, type of pigments. Um, this is a chemistry that Sudarshan does not have. It's not a big uh, type of chemistry approach uh, in, in the industry, but it does uh, also help with the uh, improved properties um, that have been trying to, uh, that were tried to achieve with the high performance azos. So taking a closer look at the classical uh, areas, 
Um, the mono azos, uh, as I as I uh, spoke before, have the single nitrogen double bond. And what I like to see is they are based off of, uh, they are building blocks of one to the other. And when I discussed the choice of coupling agent, um, it plays a key role in, in deciding the chemistry as well uh, as the technical properties as, and the color spaces that these are. This is a very good slide to, uh, to explain that. So if we start out with pigment yellow one, as I mentioned, that was the first commercial azo pigment that was made. So using that as the base structure, if we change the coupling agent from uh, from the pigment one to a pigment uh, yellow three, we see that the color uh, sh will shift to a more green shade. Uh, going to the pigment yellow 74 coupling choice, we go to a, re a red shade. And even further red uh, is the choice of coupling agent to create the pigment yellow 65. All of these start with the same base structure as the pigment yellow one, just switching out the choice of coupling agent. Same approach with the disazo uh, yellows. Um, in, and you can see there are going to be two of those nitrogen double bond areas um, in, in this category. Same approach here. The choice of the coupling agent um, will result in a choice of uh, a number of color spaces as well as the technical properties. Um, using the pigment yellow 12 as the base structure, um, going to yellow one, uh, 13 by, by changing out the, the uh, coupling agent moves it to a, a slightly redder um, in color space to uh, and then shifting to yellow 14, um, send it a little bit more to the greener side. Uh, so same with the yellow 17, even more green. And then switching over to the very red side, of course, is the yellow 83. Again, all of these are the same base structure. Uh, switching out the, the coupling agent used uh, results in the shade as well as the chemistry and properties associated with it. The monoazo salts, um, so they take on the same single double bond uh, nitrogen uh, of monoazo, uh, and then attached to that is the salt compound that is used. So what you're seeing here is the structure base of pigment red 48, uh, and then it's the same exact structure, chemistry structure, it's just the salt choice that is um, taken to create each unique pigment index. So the pigment red 48-1 uh, uses a barium salt. Red 48-2 uses a calcium salt. Red 48-3 uses a strontium salt. And 48-4 is manganese. The, the remaining structure is still all the same. It's just the salt that's used. Now, how this translates into performance um, and color is is shown here and uh, for those of you who are periodic table geeks like myself um, it relates to the location of the salt um, in the uh, periodic table so if you look at the at the second column we've got the um, calcium on top um, followed by the strontium and barium and if you look at the color positioning of each of those they tend to go uh, more towards the yellow side uh, from calcium all the way through to the barium side. But if you look to the fourth row um, where the, the calcium is on the uh, low end and the uh, manganese is on the, on the uh, higher end, uh, we see the color shifting from uh, more yellow to a uh, much more blue. So that's the color. Um, a function of this can also be derived from the periodic table. Uh, even though these four chem the chemistries have a uh, low end of um, heat stability, um, the three in the second uh, column, the calcium, strontium, and barium, uh, the 48, one, uh, 48, one, two, and three, 
um, do have a, a low end heat stability of 240, uh, where the manganese, which is um, by itself in that fourth row, um, doesn't even pass the minimum needed for uh, for heat stability. So it would never be able to to uh, to be used for plastics. So as I mentioned, uh, the azo pigment, uh, the chemistry itself is is fairly straightforward to um, to make. Uh, that's why it's a very attractive and economical um, uh, type of chemistry to produce. Here's a, an example of, of the steps that are used. And these, as I mentioned earlier, are pretty much key for every type of azo um, that is created. They'll follow the same type of, uh, of, of processing in the same type of equipment required. Uh, the only difference would be uh, the uh, choice of coupler um, that is used to create the final chemistry. And then a few unique areas um, would be for the salts. Uh, the monoazo salt products will have a step where that laking occurs. And for the high performance azos, um, the treatment is uh, similar, but it is at a, a higher uh, temperature and pressure to be able to create some of those um, higher performing uh, properties. So those of you who are a little bit more visual, a little bit uh, uh, following the uh, what the, the actual product and, and manufacturing looks like, um, once the crystals are uh, created in the reactor, that's where this slurry of pigment particles in the in the fluid, usually water, uh, is created. That water is then removed to create that press cake um, in the in the filter presses, and then those uh, that press cake is then uh, further dried in what we call um, noodles, which that's what they look like, a bunch of uh, styrofoam noodles. Um, and those are then uh, further uh, milled uh, to create the final powder. In some cases, that press cake can, can be uh, further manipulated with additional materials to create what's known as a flush. So a little bit of, uh, of uh, shape analysis in general, the azo pigments are um, much more towards the irregular side. Um, but they still uh, are sized appropriately based on the uh, properties required. Uh, for this is an example of a transparent and a opaque pigment yellow 74. This is in the monoazo category. Uh, the uh, transparent has a diameter, average diameter, about half of, of what the opaque uh, versions would be. Um, and on the disazo side, these are typically much smaller in size. Um, we have examples of pigment yellow 12 and 13, which are um, on the smaller end, uh, about 70 nanometers in, on average um, in diameter. So the life cycle of an azo pigment as, it, it's, as it's created and then used um, the pigment slurry that I that I showed you the picture of uh, in an earlier slide, um, those are primarily primary particles. Those are the crystal um, the, themselves, and then um, as that uh, slurry is uh, the, is gone going through the uh, filter presses to create that press cake, um, those particles come together into looser aggregates. Um, or, or agglomerates that are, and agglomerates um, are easily broken down or separated. Um, and then once those noodles uh, that I that I showed you are um, pulverized into the final product, that'll show up as a uh, combination of aggregates, which are very tightly bound. These are not going to be separated, as well as the agglomerates. This is what's in the bag uh, that you receive uh, when you uh, use a, a bag of pigment. Um, and then you put it into your application to disperse it further. And once that dispersion is, is completed, 
Um, you will see a, um, a combination of primarily uh, just the aggregates themselves. In some cases, you might be able to uh, disperse it well enough to create some primary particles, but the majority of them will be these aggregates. On to the high performance uh, area. Um, so I talked about these are um, being developed uh, in the 1950s and the 60s. The two approaches um, would be to enlarge the molecule, as I mentioned, with the disazocondensation type of reactions. Um, the other way of doing it is to lower the solubility of the pigment molecule um, based on what is done with the coupling agent. And that's what the uh, benzamidazolone uh, type chemistries are um, uh, it, to be able to get those high performance uh, pigment properties. So the benzamidazolone, as I mentioned, are uh, developed in, in the 1960s, um, designed specifically to improve um, the light fastness, the weather fastness, and, and the heat stability to be able to get into some of those uh, more high performance application areas like automotive and refinish in, on the coating side, as well as some of the um, higher temperature uh, plastics application. Um, for Sudarshan, we have uh, the yellow 151, 154, uh, the yellow 180 on the yellow side, and on the orange side is the pigment orange 36 and 64. The disazo condensation, as I mentioned, um, are, you know, they are intended to be very large particles, very high molecular weight uh, in there. They're not as popular. Um, and um, as, I, as, I, as you see here on the screen, that uh, there's only about 14 or so that are still being uh, used in the industry. Uh, this is one chemistry that uh, Sushan doesn't have it as far as an azo chemistry. So from going back to some of the, uh, the chemistry and the process to make these, uh, the high performance chemistry, uh, excuse me, the high performance uh, azo pigments uh, do follow that same standard uh, process of, of, of the uh, classical standard azo uh, pigments. It's in the treatment uh, and the flooding area where um, the differences lie. So in this particular, in the benzamidazolone, um, the, we need to have uh, thermal finishing um, higher temperatures and, and pressures to be able to create the specific uh, crystal shape and, and the phase, um, the size and distribution. Each of those um, choices that are made um, result in what shade you get, what opacity you get, and also the performance of light, weather, and solvent um, fastness. And then the, then the same um, type of filtration and drying that's uh, that is done as well. The disazo condensation, the second of the high performance types of chemistries, uh, again starts the same way to create that disazo base. Uh, follows the same standard azo process. Um, then the the added step of the condensation is added um, onto that um, uh, base. Uh, this is a base um, with the, with uh, the appropriate uh, uh, condensation uh, reaction, and it also then follows similar treatments, uh, thermal treatments that uh, the benzamidazolone also follows. So, you know, this is the slide that you see almost every single webinar. It's going to be a balance. Um, choosing the appropriate chemistry um, and, the, and the finishing step will give you the, the, the performance that you're looking for, but that has to be matched up with your application, um, the chemistry of that application, what process that, that you're using to disperse the pigment to make sure that you're getting the, the performance that you're looking for. So in each and every time you're going to um, have your list of must wants and nice to haves um, to be able to balance as many of those as possible to get what you're looking for um, as a pigment user. So as we go forward with uh, um, uh, emerging requirements uh, in, the, in the industry, 
Um, a few things are always key, uh, and, and primarily this is in uh, the regulatory area. So there's a number of activities that Sudershan is doing uh, in this area with respect to azo pigments. Um, um, PCBs, of course, are a big challenge, and we are establishing our grades to have that uh, PCB level to be less than a 10 per, uh, P ppm. Um, optimi optimization of uh, pigment red 112 and uh, the diarrheal yellows also to, to uh, meet some of these PCB levels that are, um, uh, are being added to the regulatory areas. Um, diarrheal uh, yellows also um, have a, um, an, a means uh, uh, issues in some areas that need to have a uh, limit of less than 25. Um, so we're working on those. Um, on the cosmetic side, there's always going to be um, some is uh, EU compliance for grades there as well. Um, and even in on the high performance azo area, pigment yellow 154 is uh, being considered for um, for uh, uh, some uh, new regulatory areas. We are part of that consortium um, to be able to try to stop that um, and have the, the pigments not considered in that particular area. So we're working to uh, to be able to, to to make sure that that doesn't happen to pigment yellow 154 because that's an important um, pigment in the in coatings. So the uh, the color selection process is very important. Um, it takes the the color formula formulator, the product designer, um, as well as the pigment manufacturer to come together um, to make sure that everything is known about that particular uh, project um, because the pigment suppliers do know a lot about um, the technology as well as the, the, the properties of each of these pigments. And so we can be a successful uh, and important partner uh, into the um, into the application areas to make sure that the final product is successful to the marketplace. So I use a couple of references and I have them here. Um, these are uh, really awesome text. Um, if you want to find more information for um, for any of these pigments, um, I highly recommend them if, if you don't have them in your library to have them in your library. Um, so next up um, is we are going to take a deeper dive as well into high performance pigments um, and asking the questions, what can they do for you? Um, that will be our March webinar, um, the last Tuesday of the month, which is March 26. Um, and so we were going to skip April for webinars because the um, uh, ACS is going to be in that month. Um, so um, we will be busy with that one and we'll pick up the webinar series uh, in um, May where we're going to take a look at pigment red uh, 48 one twos threes and fours in various application areas um, so that will be our May edition of the webinar series our North American team um, is certainly here to help uh, answer your questions and uh, give you what information that you need. So feel free to reach out to any one of us um, and we'll be happy to help. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you once again for joining us on this webinar. We really do appreciate you uh, taking the time to uh, sit down and, and listen to our presentation. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to any questions that you may have. Um, I'll go over to the chat box to see if there's anything there. Okay, there's one question there that says the pigment with the same CI is available for different applications. Technically, what is the difference between a pigment itself intended for plastic use versus, say, coatings use? Um, and the, uh, the, the, the easy answer to that one is when we develop a pigment, um, we target a certain application area. Um, the, each area will have uh, certain uh, performance needs uh, in there. So that's, that's the way a pigment comes to life, if you will. However, um, they will work 
in cross applications just fine. They will be different. They will perform differently. Um, so it's my job as a, uh, a technical support and service person uh, to make sure that you have the right product for your application, not necessarily where it was originally developed for. So you might see a, a, a color index um, with product uh, with a K after it. That's plastic C for coatings D for ink. Um, and that's where they were originally designed for. However, um, they will work uh, just a little differently. And in some cases, there might be a positive response uh, looking at a pigment from one area uh, in another area. So cross use in, in different areas is, um, is, is the way to look at it. So that's my job to make sure that you have the right product for your application needs. Another question came in, does the salt uh, types affect dispersibility and water resistance? Uh, yes, they do. So they, um, eat with each of those color indexes, because they do have a unique chemistry associated to them, with each one, they will have a different set of properties um, that go along with that chemistry. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Um, if there are no other questions or if one comes to you after the webinar, feel free to reach out. We're always here to help. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you very much again for joining us uh, with the webinar. And with that, I will close the session and look forward to seeing you again next month for our uh, March edition uh, for high performance pigments. Take care, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day.